This video is sponsored by Score. This is a platform that is teaming up with Schneider Electric to provide a competition to engineering and business students. The challenge is to solve a problem within energy management and anyone in the world can participate right from where you live with no traveling. You can come up with proposals to detect cyber attacks and home automation, how to deliver more energy in an efficient way to cities, and more examples you can find on their website. Plus, winners will be invited to the US and have a chance at a traineeship at Schneider Electric. Links are in the description below, and now let's get into the video. The jump from college to your first job will definitely yield some big differences, one of those being the amount of math you're required to do. Now, in most classes as an electrical engineer, I was doing at least some algebra, but plenty of calculus, vector analysis, and more. My first job, however, was not quite like this. Most problems in school were made in such a way that you could do hand calculations, like analyze this really ideal signal. However, in the real world, signals look more like this, where computers are needed to do the analysis. Now note, I will just be referring to my first year as an engineer. I'm only 25 years old, so I don't have years of experience, and I'm not trying to represent all engineering jobs. This is just something I experienced during my transition from school life to the real world. Now, I'd say the amount of math I was doing in that first year was way less than I was doing in school, but more than most engineers will see in their first job, at least. When I first started, I was doing only MATLAB programming. I had to work on a program that would calculate the error in antenna measurements. Because an antenna is ideally really smooth and signals just bounce off of it with no problem. But in reality, they have rough surfaces and errors will occur. Now, there were documents I had to reference for this that honestly had a lot of technical information on them, such as partial derivatives, vector analysis, and so on. But I didn't have to know how it all worked because it was pretty confusing. Most of the code was already written before I got there, so I just had to do some polishing and understand overall concepts. I remember looking at the program and seeing this line that looks something like nx equals 2x over the square root of some other stuff, which people, especially who've taken multivariable calculus, might recognize. This is for finding a vector of length 1 that is perpendicular or normal to a surface, specifically a paraboloid. This equation was for the x component of that vector, hence nx for x component of normal vector. I then looked through the papers and realized in fact this was something that needed to be calculated. Again, I was not required to know everything because a lot was already done. If someone was taking over my job and did not know that calculus information, they would have been fine because it was already implemented in the code anyway. But it was helpful to see something that I recognized from calculus 3 and relate it back to the problem I was working on. It helped put the pieces together. However, unlike Calc 3, I was not calculating the volume under surfaces or the directional derivative or anything like that. It was simply a matter of remembering overall concepts. Then I moved on to antenna testing. We worked in this big room where the antenna was put on a platform that was able to rotate. Then we could control how the antenna moved over time. We could control how it rotated this way as well as this way or the theta and phi direction. And this comes back to spherical coordinate systems which I actually also learned in Calculus 3. Now after we ran a test, the data would come back in two columns, essentially the x component and the y component. So when I was making plots, I had to program in the Pythagorean theorem to get the magnitude, which was of course easy, but still came down to me understanding mathematically how to read the data and what to do accordingly. Then from the data, one thing I had to determine was axial ratio. Now these are two simple antennas. If they're both oriented the same direction and one is transmitting, then the other receiving, everything is fine. If you turn one 90 degrees though, they won't be able to communicate. Now in practice they actually would, but in theory they can't. And this is linear polarization, where the antennas are designed to have the same orientation due to how the electric field is oriented. This is not ideal for like a satellite traveling through space, because if it turns too much then you'd lose some serious signal power. The satellite we were working on instead transmitted using circular polarization. So if the antenna was turned, it would be okay. However, in practice, as we rotated the antenna, it did lose a little power. As it turned through a full rotation, there was some angle of max power and angle of minimum power. The ratio of those two powers is the axial ratio that we were trying to calculate. So what I had to do was plot the signal strength versus the angle of rotation, and that graph would look sinusoidal. As the angle changed, the signal would go from its max value to its min value and just keep cycling as it turned. When I saw that sign plot, I had to interpret it and then calculate the axial ratio, which was just the ratio of the max to min value. Again, no crazy calculus or vector equations, just interpreting plots, understanding coordinate systems, and so on. Another common antenna plot were these polar plots that tell you the strength of the signal over different angles. If the antenna is centered, you have max strength as indicated by the blue curve being furthest away from the center. And if you turn some angle, it can tell you the new signal strength again by looking at the blue curve. 
One thing to notice is that this is on a DBI scale. It's a little too technical for this video, but overall to calculate the gain and where these numbers like negative 10 and negative 20 come from, you take the log of the actual power output of the antenna divided by some reference power, which is just a constant, and multiply that by 10. We're just basically making a new scale. Here's what's nice about this though. The antenna has some max power output, and to calculate the gain on this new scale, we just throw it into the formula and that gives us our max gain. Now, if we wanted to do the same, but for half that max power, we would of course put it in the formula and that gives us our gain at half power. Now, because of the rules of logs, you can split this up into two logarithms, one with the 0.5 on the inside and the other with the ratio inside. The second part we can just calculate and it comes out to about negative three. And this first part is just the same as our max gain from above. And again, this all equals the gain at half power. So look at how nice this is. If you know the max gain of the antenna, like if it's let's say 50, you just subtract three and you get the gain at half power. And if you wanna do a quarter power, you just subtract three again from that. It becomes a matter of subtracting, not dividing. The whole subtract three to get half power is why you see this three dB beam width. It's how far you can turn before your signal loses half its max power. The scale is not something super difficult to interpret, especially since I had a lot of practice in school. However, it was just something else I had to understand mathematically. And honestly, that was about it for all the quote unquote interesting math I got to do. There are other examples, but they all relate to what I talked about already, just for different projects. I don't think I ever had to do an integral or derivative or anything like that, but I did have to understand them in general for some of the code I was working on. In my antenna class at school, I was using Maxwell's equations and a lot of math to solve for electric and magnetic fields and so on. But in my first job, I was mainly using general concepts to understand what was going on and how to interpret the data that we got. Again, this was only my first year at the job, but is something I experienced. I know many engineers will be surprised I even used as much math as I did because a lot of people say it's rare for them to even solve an algebraic equation, but everyone's experience will be a little bit different. And I'm going to end that video here. But before you go, if you want to know more about what I did at that job, or you want to see how much math engineers use in more general terms, not just my examples, you can click the videos on the screen now. Be sure to follow me on Twitter and Facebook for updates on everything. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you all in the next video.